When storms, surges or sudden demand hit, resilience is what keeps the grid steady. It's about preparing for the unexpected while pushing ahead with digital transformation. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid. Joining us today is George Andriakos, Director of Grid Operations at Hedno. He's here to share how Greece is rethinking infrastructure, digitization, and teamwork to power the future. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, George. Hi, Mandana. Uh, thank you for your invitation, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Now, before we go into uh, the, co- the main conversation, it would be great for our viewers to understand a bit more about your role within your organization and also what some of your priorities are right now. Right. So I work for Hedno, which is the Hellenic DNO, the only a distribution network operator over here in Greece compared to other countries that they might have one TSO and uh, several DSOs. We operate the whole medium and low voltage network for the whole country and we serve about uh, 7.5 million customers. That actually translates in more than 11 million people across Greece and of course it includes businesses and uh, the market of course. I've been with Hedno for just over two years now and I hold the position of Grid Operations Director. In my department we have more of a policy view over the most critical things over here in Hedno such as inspections and maintenance of the grid, protection of electrical systems and network operations which includes our control rooms and uh, SCADA systems. Other than this I also lead the Smart Grid Initiative for Hedno, which is something that we have been quite active and uh, maybe aggressive in the last few years since we're going through a massive digital transformation as a company. We have taken a lot of initiatives with regards to digitalization and not only obviously involves, you know, the operational departments. We have a strong partnership and uh, we work alongside with our colleagues from the IT department that they have helped us a lot into this digital transformation journey, but focusing more on the operational staff. In Hedno, we have installed more than 1.5 million smart meters over the last two years, and we're about to start our massive rollout, which actually includes the, the replacement of all the traditional electricity meters across the country. Our target is uh, to achieve the installation of 7.5 million smart meters in total by the end of 2030, which is, as I said, a massive rollout, which is about to begin. However, even with this first 1.5 million meters installed, we managed to monitor more than 40% of the consumed energy, which is a massive step for us, which means that we have to deal with loads of data, real-time data in most cases, which was something that we didn't have the chance to do a couple of years ago. Also, we're we're completely redesigning our two control centers, which in my view, they're going to be transformed into energy management centers in the, the next few years, which are the control rooms from where we're going to manage the electricity grid and all the rest stations connected into the distribution network in Greece. Saying that we have more than 14 gigawatt connected into the distribution grid. And uh, it was only a couple of months ago that we managed to fully control all the rest stations above 400 kilowatts. That's interesting about the transition from control center to energy management center. What are the key features of that? What are the differences that you're going to see in the control room? Um, And what sort of new efficiencies will you experience? It has been, as I said, quite challenging for us because we didn't have the regulatory framework in place in order to be able to control the rest connected into the distribution system and at least, you know, in a way we would be more comfortable with it. This actually changed after a lot of effort that was put in place by Hedno and its team. We managed to work with the regulator and the government on this issue in order to, you know, force in a way the the generators to install telecontrol units into their systems, uh, allowing us to fully control by being able to not simply switch on and off their production, but being able to send them real-time set points as, you know, the TSO can do with, uh, well, the more limited uh, generation that it has connected into their system. So this was a major change and the most important to us because with the recent example of Spain, I think it's crucial these days for the distribution network operators to have full control over the generation that is connected into their grids. This is something that we managed to accelerate over the second half of 2025, only within the last 
four months, we have managed to control more than 3,000 in total generation sites, which uh, again, totally they contribute to about just over three gigawatt of renewable energy. Most people don't know that, but uh, I think the situation was fairly similar for most Mediterranean countries over the period of Easter, which was very crucial for us to be able to control, you know, the generation over the demand. Otherwise, we could have been potentially in uh, big trouble, leading to many unforeseen situations. And I'm referring, obviously, to blackouts due to the instability of the generation and the system. It, it was something that we managed to avoid, and we're really happy about it over here in Hedno, because we didn't even get any any close to that situation. Oh, well, that's great. Going forward, as the proportion of renewables, um, renewable energy increases in your grid, uh, what additional measures will you need to take both from a technical point of view and perhaps from a process and people point of view to mitigate against that risk in future? The situation for Hedno is uh, quite challenging for many reasons. Do not forget what Greece looks like. I'm referring mostly to the geographic fragmentation and all the islands. Many of these islands, they still rely on diesel generators. We go through, again, a massive program of uh, connecting these islands through subsea cables with the mainland's grid. We try, you know, to also allow the integration of more REST into, into these islands. They have their own central energy control center, which also utilizes SCADA and uh, other energy management systems to manage, like, local generation, storage, and dispatch. And I believe this would be an easy way to help us to integrate more renewables uh, safely on them. There is a, also the, the network expansion, which, again, quite important for us because it will actually allow us to connect more res, modernize the, the network in the same time. Also, it will lead to allow us to, to increase our hosting capacity. I think that we would be able by the end of 2025, let's, let's start discussing 2026, to accommodate new installations and uh, to increase the distributed generation hosting capacity of the distribution network. Now, you mentioned, George, about working with the regulator. I think this is something that in most European countries, utilities would like closer working relationship and more collaboration with the regulator. Can you describe for us how you achieve that collaboration in your case and what it's led to in terms of additional support, additional guidance, and just a firmer foundation for your new technology implementations. Yes, I mean, uh, discussions with the regulator are not always, uh, you know, easy. I guess that's the role in uh, most cases, to be fair. On the other hand, ourselves, and I will include the system operator as well, the, the local TSO, we have been quite active and very, very thorough in our approach with uh, the regulator, especially during the last two, three years. I think we have spent a lot of time and a lot of energy working alongside before being in a position to publish, you know, either new research or new legislation or new proposals. This has actually led to a very smooth partnership. I think it all has to do with communication, like it happens with uh, most things. I believe in, in our case, it's more than needed. It's, uh, it's actually crucial and important to be able to do that. The fact that we have a very, very strong and dedicated team of experts and engineers in our side, that they work like a uh, full time on, on the issues that they either are already on the table between ourselves and the regulator, or they will be our main topics in the next few coming years. Right. Okay. Yes. And as you say, communication is the key to that. And also for stakeholder management, I, I understand that you're working with quite an extensive range of stakeholders in terms of the uh, transmission system operator, the generators and so on. Uh, describe a little bit about how you work uh, with those parties and what level of communication is required to smooth that process. Again, at least over here in Europe, you will see over the last decade, most of the DNOs to become more customer oriented which means we take special care of our communication and um, our partnerships with uh, third parties or other, other stakeholders. Now, 
focusing on our partnership with the local TSO. Again, it's something that we have managed to build on over the last few years. We face several technical challenges together, and I think this has actually created a strong bond between the two companies. Other than this, we've been very, very open trying to accommodate the needs of our customers. And I'm not only referring to, you know, residential users, for example, so our small businesses or the public in general. I'm referring to some of our bigger customers, which, you know, we would like to extend our partnership beyond the services that we could offer until today or be used to demand from our side. And I'm referring to some of the things that are coming up for most DNOs, like demand response, flexibility contracts, and things that you know, they weren't on the table for DSOs until recently. I think we've been in a position so far to be able to offer them speed, being in a position to be able to accommodate some of these demands in a very short period, which I think it's crucial because it's uh, demands that we were not used until recently, like connections for new data centers, connections for types of load that we do not have elsewhere on our grid. So it, it, that actually brings a, a technical challenge for us and on the meantime, physical constraints uh, about uh, what the grid can actually offer without spending too much money or uh, too much time before enabling a connection, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the things that we try to discuss from, from the beginning with our customers and uh, we try to be as clear and as reliable as we, as we can since since day one and with their first approach. Right, okay. And this paradigm shift is obviously, uh, will obviously have a knock-on effect in terms of how you operate internally and the sort of skill sets that you will now expect from your workforce. Uh, so how are your um, sort of workforce development programs uh, progressing to support the energy transition? I'm glad that you're asking this, Mandana. We, we are one of, one of the biggest uh, uh, employers over here in Greece, mm -hmm. and uh, we also have a, a strong tradition in, uh, in training you know, our workforce and, uh, and our staff. However, I think it's, uh, it's quite obvious these days that uh, engineering is going to need more people. Power grids will need definitely more people, and um, you know, there will be a massive demand in the, the workforce needed for working in these uh, networks. It's something that we have picked up over here in Hedno. We do our best trying to recruit more younger and you know brilliant engineers from all the local universities and um, other technical schools. But we also invest heavily in the development of our existing staff. I do not have, unfortunately, uh, the number of hours that we spend on training over the past 12 months, but uh, it was a figure that I actually went through my eyes the other day, and it, it's, it is quite impressive. We have developed, you know, several courses for our existing staff. We do several educational cycles over the year. We have our own training school, which has been really, really busy over the last 24 months. And uh, we offer tailored training to our staff in, um, in topics that, you know, they're not offered anywhere else. Uh, you know that the industry, you know that our environment is quite unique in um, uh, distribution networks. And we try to build on, on the capabilities and on the talent of our own people. Right. Okay. That's fantastic. That's a very positive uh, move forward um, at a time when I think, as you say, the grid needs more people and more skilled people. Finally, George, um, you've kindly agreed to speak on one of our panels during the infrastructure investment briefing at SGT26 in Paris next year. Thank you very much for agreeing to contribute there. Uh, would you like to give our viewers just a quick insight into what your main message is going to be on that panel, what you'll be sharing? Well, fortunately for uh, the sake of the, of the panel in Paris, but unfortunately for Hedno, we went through a lot of challenges in, um, in the last 45 years, and I'm referring to wildfires, extreme weather conditions that we faced over here in Greece, and other, as I said, uh, challenging periods for, uh, for the grids. Uh, do not forget that we also work with aging infrastructure. I think that's the same for most DSOs. Uh, I mentioned before the geographically widespread way um, that um, our our network has been built. There is a, this complexity that it's not necessarily something that other DNOs have to deal with. We have, you know, a, a massive integration of renewables to 
uh, to work with. And uh, of course, as I said, there is, there's always the regulatory pressure and the customer pressure that we face uh, in our everyday, everyday business. No matter how big the challenges are, I think that we have actually proven that um, uh, Headnote takes resilience uh, very, very seriously. I mean, I haven't mentioned this, but before joining Headnote, I used to work for other British and uh, European DSOs, and I must say that I'm I'm also personally quite impressed by the restoration times that we achieve here at Head, especially after, as I said, big impact events like um, uh, like a wildfire or um, a really big storm. Only a couple of weeks after I joined Headno, we faced some of the worst floods in the history of the country. Um, I was present there out on the field, and uh, as I said, the restoration times that we achieved uh, during that time, it was something phenomenal in, in my view, at least. So I'll try to bring to the table some of the recent case studies uh, that have been our lessons learned over the past few months, and uh, they have actually allowed us to revisit our resilience plans and, um, you know, see how we can actually be better prepared for any any upcoming um, you know, scenarios. Fantastic. We'll look forward to hearing more from you, George, at SGT 26 in Paris in March of next year. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really um, appreciate your insights and looking forward to more next year. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you too. Thank you. Join us again next week as we unpack another big topic shaping the future of the power grid. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Smart Grid Forums, and to follow us on LinkedIn. Until then, thanks for watching and listening. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid.